Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to give everyone just a, a minute or so more to continue logging in, and then we will get started. Thanks for joining us. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on nurse visits, a tasting flight of visit models. My name is Rebecca Valley. I'm a facilitation and improvement specialist with Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation, which has been contracted by Health Insight Oregon to coordinate and facilitate these learning and action network webinars. My role today will be to simply moderate. First, just a, a brief introduction to you to Health Insights. Health Insights is the Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, or QIN QIO, serving Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Oregon. There are 14 QIN QIOs that bring Medicare beneficiaries, providers, and communities together in data-driven initiatives that increase patient safety, make communities healthier, better coordinate post-hospital care, and improve clinical quality. Quinn QIO work is grounded in principles aligning with the goals of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, quality strategy. Their strategy to eliminate disparities, strengthen infrastructure and data systems, enable innovation, and foster learning organizations. Along with 13 other regional Quinn QIOs, Health Insight is leading healthcare quality improvement initiatives excuse me, initiatives, including the Million Hearts Initiative for the Medicare program for a five-year period from 2014 to 2019, as guided by CMS. This webinar is part of the Learning in Action Network LAN efforts, as I stated, under the CMS project on cardiac health. Uh, we are pleased to be offering continuing education units for nurses on this webinar today. If you would like to receive CEU credit for this activity, um, Please note that at the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a survey, and at that point, you can enter your, your um, name and license number. Um, a quick bit about our technology as well. Throughout the presentation, we'll be checking in with you, so um, just want to make sure everyone is comfortable with the technology. On the right side of your screen is a question and answer panel. If you have questions, please feel free to enter those at any point throughout the presentation. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Um, to reduce feedback noise, everyone is and will remain on a global mute throughout the presentation. We can unmute you if you'd like to speak your question. Just raise your hand, this little icon next to the left of your name. Um, lastly, we'll also be doing some polling in this webinar, which is really exciting. So um, keep your eye out for that, and we'll explain as the time goes. Here are our learning objectives for the day, and we'll revisit those throughout the presentation. But without further ado, I am so happy and pleased to present our um, wonderful speaker for the day, um, Charmaine Kiss Charmaine has a great career in nursing. She chose nursing in order to have a meaningful, long-term relationship with patients, focusing on health and well-being. Her career has been filled with fun, positive experiences, especially since earning a master's degree in pediatrics. She has provided nursing care and leadership in school-based nursing, research, family planning, DHS home visits, family practice, pediatric specialties, and nursing supervision. Living by the motto of reaching her greatest potential by helping others reach theirs led her to the role of primary care innovation specialist with Care Oregon. Being part of a team of forward-thinking professionals in service to healthcare workers and patients statewide has opened the shutters, windows, and doors to new relationships and an even more rewarding nursing career. Um, and so you can tell she is very qualified to be speaking on this topic, and we are so excited to have her. With that, take it away, Charmaine. 
Hello all. So I will be your nurse server for your nursing flight tasting today. Uh, just one disclaimer. I just to make it perfectly clear. I understand and I recognize that nurses have been taking care of patients for decades and that nurses have had nurse visits for a very long time. This webinar is to provide a high-level overview of the current lingo and understanding and practice of specific types of nursing visits happening both in Oregon and nationwide. So the agenda for today is uh, why, are we, why are nursing visits important? And then we'll spend a little time talking about the different types of nursing visits that are currently in practice. A description of a nursing innovation collaborative that we completed at Care Oregon with eight statewide healthcare systems. And there'll be a Q&A about how you could go about developing a plan if you want to implement these specific types of RN visits in your clinic, and then how you're going to actually develop that plan, and then next steps. So first, why nursing visits? The next four slides talk about what the projected need for primary care physicians are uh, to provide the care that's needed for patients. And as you can see on each one of them, Here's Nevada needing a 77% increase in primary care physicians, New Mexico needing a 23% increase, Oregon needing a 38% increase, and Utah needing a, sorry, I can't read that. What is that one? How much? 46. 46. Sorry about that. So if we don't, so the projection is if you don't have enough primary care physicians, then who's going to provide the care for those primary care patients? The thinking with the collaborative is that nurses are set to provide that care. So why nursing visits as opposed to some other uh, format or venue for the primary care patient? There's what I have here, five reasons. So we're going to go through these. The first is healthcare costs. I don't think anyone could really argue how much healthcare costs uh, currently and how it's changed over the years and how nurses generally are looked upon as people who can provide the care but at a lower cost of a primary care physician. Provider burnout. The stats for provider burnout are pretty significant. There was a recent a literature that I read about the provider burnout and it's somewhere around the line of 63% of family medicine physicians report burnout symptoms. So that's a huge issue in primary care. Access. One of the main reasons for the clinics that I researched in prep for the nursing collaborative and those that attended the nursing collaborative was the need for access for their patients. The providers had huge panels. Patients couldn't get in in a timely manner for their health care needs. Their time to third next available wasn't looking too good. There were all sorts of access issues that can be addressed through nursing visits. Uh, Team-based care. So there's also significant literature around increased staff and patient satisfaction through team-based care. Uh, providers, I forget what uh, the percentage is, if a provider was to provide all the care for every patient, it's, you know, over 24 hours a day, so an impossible task. So using nurses in that team-based care model um, is, a, is a great way to address the patient care needs for our patient population. And last but not least, nurses have a unique skill set to provide patient care both in the primary care setting and, frankly, everywhere else that we work. Uh, I think that the training that's needed for our in business, we'll talk about that a little later, needs to be addressed in academia, but even with our current skill set, we are, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we are the perfect role for providing patient care and nursing visits in primary care. So what type of nurse visits are we going to talk about today? So there's four types, and the language that's used in this is not necessarily agreed upon 
Um, I think the language is very fluid, and clinics choose all sorts of different names for the nurse visit types that they, that they employ. We're going to use what's most commonly understood as the nurse visits that are currently in practice. So the first one is a flip visit, an independent visit, a protocol visit, and a co-visit. A flip visit, and we'll go more into detail on these, a flip visit is where the nurse begins the visit with the patient and flips the visit to the provider. A co-visit is where a provider and a nurse are seeing the patient together. So that takes on uh, all sorts of different timelines and forms, and once again, we'll go into that later, uh, but the language around that is often called a co-visit where the provider is, or the nurse is together in the room. There are independent visits, and I think nurses have been using independent nursing visits for a very long time. We see patients without the input of a provider or an MA in the room for chronic disease, for wound care, for all sorts of patient care needs, and those continue, and we will talk about those in more detail. And then the protocol visit, which is uh, often can be the big elephant in the room when you're talking to your leadership around nurse visits. And that is the nurse has a written and vetted protocol to see and assess and treat a patient independent of the provider. So the nurse uses that written protocol um, to help make decisions around patient care. And often it will also include a treatment guidelines and the ability to prescribe medication per the protocol. One thing about nurse visits is you can start a visit as, say, a protocol, protocolized visit, and in the process of the visit, the nurse assesses the patient and realizes the patient no longer fits that protocol, and the visit has to change into another kind of nurse visit. Or the nurse starts what she thinks will be here, she thinks will be a flip visit, and it turns into a co-visit. So unlike where provider visits, you know, the language is pretty much the same. It's a provider visit and the provider is responsible for every nurse visit can morph into a different type of visit during the visit itself. So my little uh, graphics here with the visits kind of floating into each other, I think that's a very real piece of nurse visits and it needs to be part of the discussion when you're clinic is thinking about implementing them, that no matter the language you use around how you want to move forward, often the nurse makes the determination based on patient presentation or assessment that the nurse visit will take on some other form, if you will, during the course of the visit. Time for a poll. All right, so the poll is open. Um, which of these visit types, so we've just given you a short definition, um, would you like to explore further and in more detail in this webinar? We'll touch on all of them, but um, if you want us to go specifically into uh, more detail about, about one versus the other. And it looks like most of you are to find your poll on the right side of your screen. Great. We'll just give everyone a, another few seconds. few more people to chime in with their vote, and I see a couple people chatting in their vote in the question in the answer pane, which is perfect. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And there are our results. Sorry, I can't. Oh, there you go. I'm looking at your results. So we have 
65% protocolized, and then second is new patient COVID. Okay. Well, no surprise there. <laughs> I think as I, when I was going through the description, protocolized RN visits are certainly the most innovative and forward-thinking of the four visits that we're going to talk about today. So thank you for pulling. That was awesome. Um, so briefly, let me, and you will get a copy of these slides. Uh, so each visit has these feature tables on them, uh, describing what the potential for the RN role will be during the visit, the provider role during the visit, and how positive or negative those, that type of visit will impact the clinic and the patient. So I'll let you uh, review those, and we'll dive deeper into the protocolized ones. But once again, this is, these tables are a guideline, I think, within your clinic itself and within the state that you practice in. Scope of practice certainly impacts what role the RN has in each of these visit types. Um, so that always needs to be addressed when you're implementing the RN visit. So here's the foot visit, uh, what the uh, nurse would do. And I have a question mark at Scribe. I was actually visited a clinic where the nurse scribes during the provider portion of the FLIP visit, which is an interesting role for nurses. And it was interesting to see. Doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but that certainly is an option for a FLIP visit for the nurse to stay in the room. Um, unlike, not similar to a co visit, but the nurse simply acts as a scribe during the provider piece of the visit. There's a new patient um, co uh, establishing care co visit. So the new patient piece of it, I have to mention the billing piece. So according to CMS, nurses cannot bill new patients. So this is this would be a non billable visit for a nurse if it was a new patient, but that still doesn't mean that the nurse can't be a part of a new patient visit for a provider. And so it would be, once again, the lingo it can be challenging, but the nurse would see the patient initially during the visit, and then when the provider came in, the nurse would still be in there and be an active part of the visit, but it would be billed under the provider. So this would be the potential for the nurse role, once again, the provider role, how it would impact the clinic and the patient. I'm going to skip to the RN visit itself. So these are visits that we've done for a really long time in primary care. Uh, we, whether it's in the triage form where a patient walks in and we see the patient and make a determination using, using our nursing and critical thinking skills, or whether it's scheduled for uh, wound care or chronic disease management, this is a visit that's been around for a really long time. Uh, and these are the roles, once again, and how it impacts the clinic and the patient. All right, let's flip back to these protocolized visits. So a protocolized nurse visit, um, wow, can be really challenging and also really awesome. Uh, it takes a lot of work, and it takes the input from a lot of leadership and provider and nurse communication to write a protocol to train to a protocol and to implement a protocol nurse visit. There are a lots of examples out there that um, are available as a template for a protocolized nurse visit. And there are requirements from, likely from your board of nursing for what the protocol has to entail. And certainly if you're going to bill a protocolized nurse visit, there are requirements as well. And a protocolized nurse visit, once again, is not, like all the other visits, is not the same for every clinic that's going to employ it. Some of the clinics that we have worked with and that I researched do not have any treatment options in a protocolized nurse visit that require a prescription. So there are nurse treatment options, but they do not make the prescribing of medications part of a protocolized visit. Others do, and it is embedded in their protocol. And it's a part of the conversation that needs to happen within the clinic as to whether you decide to take that step in the protocol for your protocolized nurse visit. So there's also a discussion around whether a protocolized nurse visit is symptom-based or diagnosis-based. 
um, based on the scope of practice that says a nurse cannot give a medical diagnosis. So figuring that out and communicating with your leadership needs to be another part if you want to move to a protocolized visit. Is it going to be symptom-based in the patient that walks in with ear pain? Or is it going to be written in a language where you do a medical diagnosis um, around whatever, whatever the diagnosis is? I can tell you that most of the clinics to get around that medical diagnosis piece are doing symptom-based protocolized nurse visits. So the protocol includes everything that is required for the nurse to, to follow the protocol, but also required to bill the visit itself. So that's why under the RN role, it says all visit components per the protocol. Some clinics would have an MA do the vital, but uh, we certainly have the skill set to do that. We have the skill set to assess the patient, to take the history, to provide all of the point of care testing to follow the protocol if the patient meets all of the assessment and history for whatever that symptom base is, and to follow treatment guidelines from a provider and complete the visit and send the prescription if that's what your scope of practice in your state allows. So if it's a completely independent protocolized nurse visit, your provider has no role in it whatsoever other than the medical director has already signed the protocol for the nurse to practice underneath of it. The provider does not have to step into the room. The nurse follows the protocol and makes that determination whether the patient meets the protocol or not. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it could flip into a different kind of visit if the nurse uh, assesses the patient and realizes they don't follow the protocol. How does that impact your clinic? Well, it can be challenging when your schedulers try to figure out which patient falls under your protocolized nurse visit protocol. So having a matrix or training or however you want to move forward with your schedulers to make it easier on them, who goes on the nurse protocolized visit schedule and who doesn't can be challenging. It's certainly a positive for your providers because the goal is to not have them have to step into the room and therefore they have patients that can see a nurse and they can fill up their schedule with other visit types. It can reduce your time to third next available. If you use protocols for low acuity visits like sore throat and ear pain and whatever the symptom base is that you decide, those patients can see the nurse. And once again, the provider can reduce their time to third next available. Reimbursement can be challenging. And we'll talk about what the incident to is and what are the requirements before, for that. But there, you can certainly bill uh, protocolized nurse visits if you meet those requirements. And then as a nurse, the scope um, and your satisfaction with your job, when you're able to see a patient independently, when you have that training um, that allows you to see that patient, when you have that added patient interaction, when your patients um, seem more satisfied, uh, it just I don't think you can actually put into words what that means as a nurse to be able to provide that. And then for the patient, they can certainly get in in a more timely, hopefully, um, in a more timely way. So they're getting the care they need and the time they need because they're seeing a nurse rather than waiting for a provider. Um, I this, this is from me, but I think that every patient interaction is benefited by RN intervention. So. Patients being able to see a nurse, to me, just makes sense. The, the negative, if you want to call that, for the providers, there's been providers, and I think there will continue to be, that feel like they're missing out on their interaction with their patients, especially for low acuity, that they miss that, that they're not getting to see their patients as much. There's that uh, sense that you know they're handing over their care to someone else. And I think it's important to address that in the beginning with your provider group when you're talking about implementing RN visits is to have that discussion and to talk about how they're going to feel about that if you want to start with certain protocols so that they have some, uh, some control over who's seeing their patients and for what. I think that needs to definitely be a part of the communication both initially and ongoing. And lastly, established patient only. So once again, um, there are requirements for
for a nurse to see a patient under a protocolized visit and certainly to bill for it. Nurses um, cannot bill for new patients. And part of the incident, too, is that the PCP has uh, requested, if you will, the protocolized visit. So the current state of health care and nursing visit is a protocolized visit needs to be with an established patient uh, only. Uh, I have a question here. Can LPNs do protocolized visits? So that is scope of practice, and that is an awesome question. Uh, we addressed that in, a collabor in the collaborative that we did here, whether or not it's within an LPN scope of practice to see patients independently. I would refer you to your board of nursing and the scope for LPNs in your state. It is not the same, just as the nursing scope of practice is not the same in every state. Uh, that includes LPN. Okay. Moving on. So that's the protocolized nurse visit uh, deeper dive. How are we doing on that? Good. Yay. Okay. So reimbursement. This is the other elephant in the room is how are you going to bill for your nurse visits? So you've trained your nurses to follow a protocol or to have uh, if they've been a triage nurse for a long time and they haven't had direct patient care, that added um, updated training on health history and assessment. And now you want reimbursement for that, which makes absolute sense and should always be a part of the conversation when you're implementing our visits. There are a lot of rules around it, um, and it can be challenging. And there are some there are some things that you can do to ensure or to feel better about seeking reimbursement, but I have to say this is a really new thing, uh, reimbursing for nursing visits, and it's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's an unknown, so there can be some anxiety around that, but I think like everything else that we do in healthcare, um, if, you, if you understand what it is that you need to do and you make every effort to follow through with it, that uh, that you should feel confident that you're doing the right thing and try to seek out reimbursement for your nurse visits. So this screen is courtesy of a webinar that you're going to see in the reference list, but is also courtesy of CMS. So these are the requirements for reimbursement for a 99211 for a nurse visit. So once again, the patient must be established. So a nurse cannot bill for a patient care visit if they are a new patient. Once again, it doesn't mean they can't see that new patient. We can provide care to everyone that walks in the door, including those new patients. And if that works for the clinic, then you should certainly implement that, but you couldn't bill for that new patient visit under the nurse. There needs to be an evaluation and management service. There needs, the service has to be separate from, some, from another visit on the same day. There has to be a plan of care or a provider consult. And this is the part in the table that, we, that I talked about where the pr provider has to provide guidelines that the patient can see the nurse under that protocolized visit. So if, if the protocol isn't in the patient's chart or EMR or it isn't referenced by the provider in the chart, that they want that patient to see the nurse under this condition with this protocol, however you want to language it, then you can't bill for it. It doesn't mean the nurse can't see that patient and under a nurse visit, but you couldn't bill for it without either, either the provider stepping in the room or the nurse consulting with the provider and documenting that or that plan of care in the chart. Those are required for you to bill the nurse visit. And then the physician or the billable provider, nurse practitioner or PA, once again, whatever your state um, healthcare currently is, must be immediately available to provide assistance and direction. So during a collaborative, this came up. What does immediately available mean? Does it mean on site? Does it mean one floor above? Does it mean across the street at the coffee house on a break? What does that mean? Well, I would just uh, support you in if the provider isn't there in the clinic, if they aren't immediately available, if the nurse was to have 
something happened with that patient, then that is not immediately available. If during the assessment that nurse needs a provider, and it doesn't have to be the provider that wrote the plan of care, it doesn't have to be the PCP, but if there isn't a, a provider that's available during that visit, then you're not meeting the requirements for reimbursement for that visit. Phew. Okay. So this collaborative that I keep talking about, uh, these are the dates that we completed the collaborative. This is the first collaborative uh, of, for nursing innovation that I'm aware of in Care Oregon. We invited clinics across the state of Oregon and to come every single month for four hours to talk about nursing visits and how to implement them and the process through it. These are the dates. These are the things that we talked about. These are the things that we educated each other on, that we shared knowledge and that we learned from in order to implement nurse visits. The information for this came from a number of different sources, and there are some in your reference list that I really support you in reading, but there were three clinics around the nation that I researched and went to visit in preparation for this. And they are a clinic in California, a clinic in Colorado, and then one here in Oregon. And the, the format or the, um, the agenda that you see here was based on my research and visiting those clinics. Communication is the first one because it is the most important thing. I can't stress enough that this is a huge culture shift for a clinic to take to start having their nurses see patients independently and bill for them and to have protocols for nurses to see patients independently. So communicating from the start, in the middle, the end, and every other time you can think about is going to make or break implementing nurse visits and is impossible to sustain if you don't continue the conversation with your leadership, your provider group, and your nurses. So that, uh, and the other pieces there are important as well, and as you have your communications and figure out how you're going to implement, I would use that as a reference. Have we covered this? How are we going to address documentation, billing? What is the visit going to look like? All of those pieces that you see there. The next three or four screens are the actual report outs from the clinics that attended the nursing collaborative. So um, they are not, you, you will see that there are no names attached to them. The reason that I want to share this with you is so that you can look at the progress that they made, whether you consider how long it took or who was involved with it or how fast it, whatever you can glean from these, I think it's really important for you to review this to see what the clinics actually reported out, how this process happened for them. Uh, and I will leave you to review these um, when you have, at your leisure, but so that you understand the colors. So green means that they actually wrote a protocol during the collaborative. Yellow highlight is they trained, whether they trained with a provider, whether they provided specific nurse training, however they chose to train their nurses in preparation for this, that's the yellow. The purple is they implemented visits. So they had protocols, they completed their training, whatever process they went through, they were able to, during the collaborative, implement some form of an RN visit. And then there's, there we go, there's another color. So the blue is they found a champion in the clinic, which could be a clinician, could be a nurse, someone that championed this process uh, for their clinic, and I think that's very important as well. There needs to be someone who says, I, there is value in this, and I want to see it happen, and I'm going to guarantee that we move along uh, in the way that you know, whatever works for the clinic. So that's what the blue is. So you, once again, will see the process the clinics went through. I want to call out uh, a couple. So here, number seven, this clinic had a really challenging time in that they're uh, halfway through the collaborative. Their medical director uh, received a terminal diagnosis. And I want to call that out because I think that it can be 
more challenging when you have a change in your leadership, whether it's someone that leaves the clinic or a change in role, or for instance, this clinic with a terminal diagnosis. It's very easy to have this huge culture shift be derailed by that. So planning for that and once again communicating about that so that you don't lose the momentum, that if you need to you know, reshape or reframe how you want to move forward, um, needs to be a part of that communication and understanding of implementation. And the other, the clinic number eight here, they, if you can see, they have every color um, that I highlighted, and they had, they had so much um, um, people on board with this, and they seemed to have so much fun with it, and every time we met, they had so much to talk about. Their movement was really, it was huge, and it was satisfying for them, and they took the time that they needed, and it, it was, I think they're just a great example of a clinic that started where they needed to with a communication. If you look at first session, they had that provider champion. They found that champion. They started training. They started writing the protocols. They, they really put a lot of thought and effort into this um, to get to where you see in session four. They had multiple protocols ready to go for their nurse visits. Questions. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions before we move on to the next section, which will be um, helping you develop a plan about how you are going to potentially take this back to your practices. So now is the time to ask any sort of clarifying questions. If you want us to go back with something, um, now is the time. So one question we got, Charmaine, was. Um, for RN seeing patients for chronic disease management, do they typically work from protocols in your experience? I think it depends on what you want the what the clinic wants the chronic disease management to look like. I think if part of the chronic disease management visit is a titration of medications, whether it's for uh, someone with a diagnosis of diabetes or hypertension, if that's going to be a piece of the chronic disease management, is the nurse. Um, following assessment of the patient makes the determination that there needs to be some kind of medication change, that a protocol for that titration is important. Okay. Thank you. Um, there were also a couple of questions about implementation, and I know you were talking about the, the um, collaborative a little bit, but um, a few people wanted to know what were some of the challenges presented. So obviously, if the leadership is, um, you know, can't be a part of the process for whatever reason. But what other challenges were faced by these practices? Mm -hmm. So both with the clinics that attended the collaborative and also the three that I visited in preparation for the collaborative, the biggest challenge um, and the reason that I talk about it all the time is the communication. So for all of the clinics, I think the biggest challenge for the communication wasn't actually initially finding uh, someone in their leadership or provider group to jump on board and buy in and be a part of this. It was the communication that's required to sustain it, especially between the providers and the nurses. That Because you have turnover, you have providers that um, take on different roles. You have nurses that inevitably get moved around and their duties either get added to or in some way change. And having that open, um, continuous communication between the provider and the nurse uh, was, it actually is uh, based on my communications with the clinic, it is the biggest challenge, is, is having that happen all the time and not having it stop. Making sure that you have dedicated time, whether it's before the visit, after the visit, um, dedicated time in meetings for providers and nurses who are a part of this to talk about what's happening in the visit, how they're feeling about it, how they're communicating with each other, how the documentation is going, uh, sustaining that so that you can sustain your RN visit. So that's mostly just informal communication, or whether is that it, any uh, like written communication about that that goes out to the clinic, or 
the, one of the clinics that I researched that uh, I imagine a number of you have heard about is Clinica in Colorado. And while I was there, they talked about all of the different ways that they try to sustain communication, healthy communication between their providers and nurses. And one of the most recent efforts they made was a program called SBI, Situation Behavior Impact. And they were piloting that to see if that could help uh, improve some challenging conversations that happen between providers and nurses in the course of RN visits. So I think unless you already have a trust relationship between your providers and nurses based on you know, successful telephone triage or a long-standing working relationship with each other where the provider it trusts that nurse. Having whatever the form is, having some kind of formal plan for communication is, is important to start with. Maybe having them train together on nurse visits, however you want to uh, implement it in your clinic. Unless you're like a rock star and already and already have staff that communicate fabulously, picking some formal or more structured way to start communicating is a good idea. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody also asked about um, feedback from patients. Was when you were working with the clinics in the collaborative, were any of them able to highlight? specific stories or feedback from patients about how this works? Okay. That's an awesome question, and I'm so glad somebody asked it. Um, so two of the clinics that I visited in prep for this collaborative, uh, the data around things like reimbursement and staff and patient satisfaction didn't all flow in the same direction. So the reimbursement piece they actually struggled with, weren't necessarily able to meet their goals around it but they chose to continue the process of implementing and sustaining nurse visits based on their patient satisfaction scores alone. They had such uh, an increase in patient satisfaction with the nurse visits that that was their sustaining drive and motivation for continuing this, this journey. Yeah. That's pretty wonderful. cool. Yeah, that's pretty really cool. cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, somebody asked about a reference for the SBI, is that um, is there a specific reference for that, or so it it, it is a um, an established program. I think you can actually even Google SBI or Situation Behavior Impact, um, and you will find information on it. If not, uh, and you wanna, I think my email is here in the slide somewhere. Um, you can email me, and I will send you what I have on the SBI program. Perfect. Okay. Great. And then last set of questions, um, we had a question come in and then there were some questions that folks posed during registration about um, getting more support for doing nurse visits in their clinic. So somebody, and I, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit in, in developing our plan for taking it back, but somebody's seen this webinar and they think it's really great, they're on board. How do they then bring that back and get support from other care team members? Well, I think, uh, I think figuring out or having that discussion and communication around why. Why does this clinic, why does our patient population need or would benefit from nurse visits is a really important data point. Uh, and it's not necessarily the same across the board. Uh, there are some clinics that came to the collaborative that chose to do this because their nurses asked for an increase practice and innovation around the care that they were doing, whether that's I want to get off the phone for a while while I do a triage, or whether their role was more administrative and they wanted to go back to patient care, or the data around things like third next available and um, whatever it may be, I think understanding where your clinic is at and finding that data and starting the conversation is going to garner the support that you need to help move this. Okay, so maybe we can continue talking about that a little bit um, in the next few slides about bringing this back to everyone's organization. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a fair, even though this is sort of a, a newer thing um, in nurse in primary care nursing, I think there's also significant data out there, for instance, those clinics that I researched, and there's an article in the reference list that kind of talks about 
um, and if you need to bring back the data around why this is a pretty cool and important innovation. Awesome. Okay. Oh, one last question that just came in. Another iterator will, um, and then we'll move on. Is have you documented any barriers to R and visits um, or patients wanting to see a physician instead of a nurse? And if so, were those challenges addressed by other clinics? Uh, yes. So I think that there's always going to be a patient that, especially initially, because they're so used to it, patients are as used to seeing their provider as the providers are used to seeing the patients, and nurses aren't used to seeing patients independently. That's very true. There is an absolute patient education piece around this. I told the clinic the other day when we were talking about it, I think a huge part of the patient education is the providers, when they have a patient in the room, saying, you know, if, if, if you experience this again, um, we have nursing visits available to you. I have this, you know, I work with this nurse, and kind of talking about the nurse and how these visits are available to patients goes a long way towards uh, patient understanding of and comfort level with RN visits. But yes, all of the clinics had patients who said, you know, I'm not comfortable with this, I want to see my provider. Some of them, uh, through the course of nurse visits and actually having a provider even step in the room um, for those instances, and then once again, having a provider say, you know, this is a nurse I trust, we work together, I'm always available during this nurse visit, whatever the language is, moved some patients to a greater comfort level, but there wasn't, there's always a patient that said, I don't want to see a nurse, sure. And I think that needs to be okay. I mean, we're here to do patient-centered care, and even though this is uh, an option for innovation to change access and costs and all of those things I talked about initially, there, it needs, the door needs to be open for a patient to say, you know what, I, I, I just want to see my provider. Great. Yeah. Okay. Good reminder, it's about the patient. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks, Charmaine. we got a couple more slides here. Right? Okay. So the plan. So how are you, you going to do this? Well, if I haven't said it enough, I'll say it again. It has to be communicated. Um, it has to be communicated from the nurse to the provider, the provider to the nurse, the leadership to all of the staff, the schedulers, the MAs, to the patients. The communication needs to happen continuously um, and change it up however you need to, provide it in whatever format you need to. It needs to be an ongoing part of implementing RN visits. I think it's important to get the data that you need to change minds, to move the culture within your clinic, um, to get the data once you implement nurse visits. What kind of things are you changing for the patients? Um, what is the third next available? How are patient outcomes being changed by nursing visits? What is the patient satisfaction? And then using that data to continue um, to innovate further. What is, you know, whatever successes or challenges you have, what does the data show, and learn from that data. I think the training the nurse, um, who's going to do the training? I mean, we've been trained. You know, I, there are nurses out there that have gone to just as much schooling as me, if not more. But if they're not used to having direct patient care with patients, if they're not used to, if their role has been one of administration or telephone triage, and they aren't, they're not up to date or they haven't practiced or implemented nurse visits, and so that whole piece of patient history and putting a stethoscope on the patient for the first time in 10 years around the, uh, the assessing of the patient, all of that, I think it's important to talk to your nursing staff about that, where they feel like their barriers are, even if it's just using an EHR in a different way, because documenting an independent nurse visit is very different from documenting other things in patient care. Having the training so that the nurses feel comfortable with that, and if the provider can be a part of that training, which helps build that trust relationship, you are a long way ahead. If, that, if you can make that happen, kudos and yay. And then lastly, I'm going to say it again. I just can't tell you enough. Uh, it's going to, you know, communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Another poll. Another poll. Our last one for the day is how are you going to take this information back to your practice or team? And, and more, it's really for us to really kind of know, did we give you enough? What else do you need? Um, so I'm going to launch this here and give everyone 
about a minute or so to respond. We just want to know, yeah, are you, was this great for you? You're ready to go ahead and, and start implementing? Do you need more information? Do you need, you know, support from someone? All right, I think that's everyone who's going to get their vote in here. I'm going to close it and share it with everyone so you can see. Okay, let's see where we're at. So we have 47% they can work on implementing some of the features, 22 not quite sure, 36 wants additional information. I love that. Yay. Super. Well, um, terrific. For those of you that want more information, yay, that means that you're thinking about it, that you found something useful in this. For those that you're going to you think you can take something back, even better. Uh, there were a couple of questions that came through. One was on CPT codes. So the, the billing is another one of those monster challenges in this. And if you, there is, I, there's no standard that I know about around how to ensure that despite everything that you do that you're going to get reimbursed. If you have a, a certified coder and biller um, that you can work with, that the nurses can work with on what documentation is required to ensure that the codes that you're using um, get reimbursed, I, I would support you in that. The clinics that I've worked with and that I uh, visited, they most often use the 99211 for their nurse visits. There was another question around uh, protocolized templates or what a protocol looks like. There's actually a lot available just by Googling it, but if you want some specific ones that I shared with the Nursing Collaborative, my email is on there. Please send me an email. I'm happy to share. All of the clinics that I visited uh, freely shared their protocol with me and were fine with me sharing because they wanted to move this, uh, this implementation and this process forward for primary care nursing as well. So here's some other uh, references for you. Care Oregon actually is going to be presenting at the um, Oregon Center for Nursing Fall Conference. For those of you that are in Oregon, uh, we're going to do a presentation on team-based care uh, in primary care nursing. There is my email for the collaborative. If you're in Oregon, once again, there's a potential for a collaborative number two uh, for clinics that didn't attend number one. Please send me an email and I will forward that on. The articles you see are articles that I actually read in prep for this and that I had the clinics that attended the collaborative read as well. They're really valuable um, to start the conversation, to have better understanding of what's happening nationally with nursing visits. And then, as I mentioned in the reimbursement slide, there is a webinar on best practices for documenting and billing uh, that was provided by a uh, coder from Multnomah County Health Department. That is the link for that as well. It's a great reference. It was a great webinar. And um, the information on that webinar was um, not represent the respective organizations who presented it, but um, I think OP, uh, Oregon Primary Care Association hosted it, and then and uh, we'll also include that on our website after this. But for those of you, and I just want to plug in real quick, but for those of you not in Oregon, um, all of your I think all of your um, state leads to your Health Insight are on the call, and. Um, if they can just type in their email there, um, there are resources for you as well. So if you are not in Oregon and um, part of Health Insight um, or part of their or working on their um, various tasks, go, feel free to reach out to them and, and say, hey, we'd like some help with this, with implementing this. Um, the a question we all, always get and I forgot to say something about is um, the recording and the slides, yes, will be made available. Um, Following this, we'll be posting it to the Health Insight website, and each of you should get a link to that website. Um, 
within the next day or so, directly from GoTo. So. And um, with that, I will give you just a few minutes um, just shortly after this to please fill out the um, post-webinar evaluation. If you are requesting CEUs, um, you must fill out the evaluation because that's the only way we can get um, all of your information, and um, including your license number and um, some of the questions we needed to ask about how well we did today. And um, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for being on the call. Thank you so much, Charmaine, for sharing your expertise and you know walking us through this collaborative. This is really amazing, and um, I hope that everyone got a lot out of it. I know I did. So thanks. You're welcome. My pleasure. And uh, the next webinar will be Thursday, September 22nd on um, shared decision making. So stay tuned for that for a link to register. But. Otherwise, I will give you the rest of your afternoon back. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.